thank you so much for a wonderful experience. Um, our plan for now is, uh, of course, to make as much use as possible of this unique opportunity to talk to the three of you, uh, to have your help in uh, digesting the very intense experience uh, that I think this has been for everyone who's watched the documentary. And uh, basically what will happen is that uh, I'll ask Laura to uh, talk to us a little bit about her thoughts and then uh, quite soon I'll open up for questions from the room and uh, we'll try to uh, have as many as possible, of course. Um, so uh, start thinking about uh, questions and thoughts uh, right now. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, all three of you. You're all three main uh, people in this uh, documentary. And first of all, uh, Laura Poitras, um, this is, um, even though you're only seen in a mirror at a certain point and your voice is heard and you're not in the frame, this is a first person documentary too. It takes off with your own very personal experience and I think uh, that gives it a very um, intense tone. Uh, you enter into what is a very technical and abstract issue in a very personal manner and I'd like to ask you, um, has Snowden made the difference that he hoped for in your experience? And I want to ask you not only because you've made this documentary but because you've been very intensely involved in a lot of the uh, reporting that's taken place afterwards. So only Saturday, Laura received a Danish uh, investigative journalism award for being a very central part of publications of Danish stories based on this material. And I know you've been very heavily invo involved in this. How, how close are we getting to see any kind of shift or change that comes close to what Ed Snowden was hoping for when he contacted you first? Those are a few different things. First of all, I want to thank the festival for having me. Um, uh, it's really wonderful to be here, and, and um, I've been following the filmmaking that's coming out of Denmark now, and it's actually the, it's sort of at the forefront of innovation, both in, in documentary filmmaking and fiction filmmaking, so it's a really incredible town to be here and to show this film, so thank you for, for having me. Um, in terms of, um, you know, what, what, what Edward Snowden communicated, or what his concern was, is that the world wouldn't care and uh, that these revelations would come forward and that he would have taken these risks and the world wouldn't care. And I think that, you know, we passed that bar on Wednesday in Hong Kong. I mean, the day that, that, that Glenn published the first story about Verizon, um, collecting all the call data records of all U.S. citizens, and every, every media organization in the U.S. and internationally covered it. And then when, by, the, by the end of the week, after we'd published the documents on PRISM, we'd already passed what, you know, his concern that the world wouldn't care because the world certainly did care. Um, and I think his other, you know, real strong sense is that these are programs that shouldn't be happen, that shouldn't be conducted in secret, that we shouldn't have, you know, governments that have secret courts and secret interpretations of laws that are, uh, that are engaging in this level of surveillance. Um, uh, and, and so that is another thing that, you know, clearly right now has, he, he's been successful at changing. I think that the, the real question now is what have governments done in terms of changing policy? And that's, you know, that's still an ongoing question. Um, because it, right now, um, the programs that have been exposed, many of them are ongoing. And, uh, and so we're, you know, we still have in the U.S. the collection of the, the, the phone records of U.S. citizens. Um, and other programs are still ongoing. They might have reined in some um, because of the reporting that we've been doing. Um, uh, but, you know, for instance, uh, one of the stories that I worked on with, with Jacob was the Angela Merkel's cell phone. And maybe, perhaps, she's not being spied on. I mean, but we don't know. Um, but, but so maybe some of that more sort of really targeted surveillance they've, they've stepped back on. But, um, but we've also seen a lot of um, changes happening in technical communities. So you have Right now, um, I think that in addition to the free software um, projects like the Tor, uh, the Tor project that, that, that Jacob works with, and Tails and OTR, the things that we thank in the credits that are you know available now for people to use um, to encrypt their data, we're also seeing the, the telecoms realizing that they have to respond because they're going to lose business. I mean, I think that people understand that they 
um, that people in you know that are in Google or Facebook understand that international um, customers also feel that they should have privacy. So they're making some changes to to what they're doing. So so in terms of technology, we actually are seeing changes. And the government, um, you don't pose the question directly to the government in the documentary. What were your thoughts about that, about having the voice of, uh, of the accused? I mean, like, as you said earlier, I mean, I, it, the type of filmmaking I do is, um, I feel, I, I, I look at big issues, but I look at the through the lives of people. And so the people that I, that I, that I followed are the people that, so it's, um, in this case, I mean, for me, it's really a story about why it is that people, um, f like, what is happening with, particularly my country, that has gone so far off track in terms of its policies and what it stands for, that people are willing to risk so much to tell the public what's happening. So you have William Binney, who was, you know, in the NSA for over three decades, and and it, it reached a point where he was like, no, I'm, I'm willing to take the risks and, and become a whistleblower. And you have Edward Snowden and others. And um, and so it's that that's what I'm interested in in terms of the story that I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to step back and you know tell an objective you know not even just a, it's not about objectivity, but it's but it's it's. It's like I believe that we can understand sort of issues through the lives of individuals. So I think with with Edward Snowden, why is it that a 29-year-old would take the risks that he took to reveal this information? Why would you give up so much? And that if you can understand that, then maybe you can understand why these issues are so um, vital uh, to um, to for our democracy to understand. So. Now, before I open the floor, I just have one more question. I know there's lots of journalists here, so others are probably thinking about the same question. One of the hopes that Edward Snowden expresses right at the beginning is that someone else might be inspired by him. Um, this second leaker, um, what can you tell us about uh, the second leaker that's not there? Uh, do you have more stuff coming? Can't you say anything? What's going on? Are other people getting inspired? I mean, uh, maybe, and also I'm going to ask Jake, I'll, I'll answer it and then I'll ask Jake to also address it. But um, I mean, it's not really about counting how many people have come forward. There are many, many sources. All of the reporting has been done, you know, that I've worked with has been done with many sources. And that it's not, that's not the, the question. The question is, is what's happening in our government and why is the government becoming sort of in, increasingly secretive and that people are having, uh, people who are seeing wrongdoing are having to take the risks that they're taking. And so for me, the end of the film is, is not so much like about, oh, who is that, you know, that's individual because obviously as a journalist I'm not going to talk about sources, particular sources, but what we wanted to communicate is that the that there is a, um, a war on, on, on whistleblowers right now in the United States, that they're being targeted. So the, there's the people who are exposing wrongdoing and instead of looking at the actual people who are committing the wrongdoing, we're looking at the people who are exposing it. And then we also have a war on, on, on journalists and, and targeting journalists and pulling them into um, leak investigations. And so that's kind of, we wanted to end the film on a note that's saying that these that even though maybe this, you know, um, that Snowden has political asylum, um, it shouldn't make people feel that that these programs are have been uh, stopped or that the risks aren't really very real. Do you want to talk about also? I don't have anything to say about sourcing, <laughs> <laughs> except that <clears throat> one thing, which is someone you trust is one of us. All right, well, uh, I'm sure everyone is aware, but we have a, a panel consisting of, uh, how many years were you in the NSA? Uh, Just a little over 36. All right, so a veteran of the NSA uh, who is among uh, the first people who have uh, stepped out and uh, felt that it was necessary to uh, make a public issue of what was going on. We have Laura and we have Jacob Applebaum who, um, uh, has, is very involved in the Tor project and uh, encryption issues generally and has recently been in Denmark once before uh, to be a witness in the Danish court case against uh, Anakata of uh, Pirate Bay. So um, please uh, let's open up and I'm going to hear a couple of questions and uh, try and see uh, if I can keep track of all of them so that we have as many questions as possible and I'm not sure if there's a microphone yeah and there's there's it's hard the people in the back with the lights we can't see the people in the yeah. back rows so if you want to bring up the house lights a little but um, we can start out here which is the place where I can see so please stand up when you have a question and I think just 
speak loudly. Yes, uh, why did you reveal the identity and the whereabouts of Edward Snowden before he reached his final destination? All right, so uh, this question was why reveal the identity and the whereabouts of Edward Snowden before he reached his final destination, um, Moscow as it turned out to be. But let's just hear a couple of other. Yeah, down here. That's probably mostly a question to our specialist here. Will we ever get our privacy back? <laughs> Are you Paul Will we? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Will we ever get our privacy back? All right, uh, one more question. Oh shit! <laughs> you should come up here. That's amazing. It's like the most. <laughs> You're my hero. Right. There's almost uh, very few. Uh, these are the others. Uh, you might need to come. On the let's stage. get one more question before we have the panel come back. Everyone is overwhelmed by the second question. Okay, who wants to go first? Benny, Mr. Finney, when will we get our privacy back? I will take on the privacy. First, first of all, I would say, uh, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. That's a great quote from Joseph Goebbels. Okay? Plus, 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 if you think that, that's totally irrelevant. It doesn't matter what you think. It only matters what the government thinks. So what you think is irrelevant. Now, to get your... Will you ever... Uh, my answer to that is no, not the way things stand now. And unless we do something to, uh, because this is not just the NSA, okay? The NSA is in this with many other agencies around the free world. Uh, so far, we haven't gone behind the former Iron Curtain yet, but but uh, the NSA is not alone in this, and then they've got a lot of help from a lot of uh, friendly governments. Uh, there are 33 known uh, third parties, for example. Uh, first party is U.S., second party are the other four uh, English-speaking countries, Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Great Britain. And then every, everybody else is a third party. And there are 33 of those uh, around the world. Uh, not all are participating in this, uh, and not all have X key score. But they're all, um, they're all involved in one way or another with NSA, maybe not in the digital world, but uh, in other worlds. So there's a cooperative level uh, of uh, 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 transactions and transfer of data and information. And even X key score allows them to get into this central database. So unless we address this as a world issue, um, I, it's going to be pretty hard to get your privacy back. My, my, I, uh, Kirk Wiebe, Ed Loomis, and Tom Drake and I and Diane Rourke have been suggesting ways to the U.S. government, specifically to Obama, and he's ignored them all, of course, to ways and means of fixing NSA. Uh, and one of the ways, one of the things we try to emphasize to him is you cannot trust your intelligence agencies. You, the President of the United States. Congress can't trust them either because they lie to Congress. They lie to themselves even. Between each other, they lie. So uh, they will do whatever they deem necessary for their purposes. And that's why the, the US government and every government needs to have some means and some way of ensuring that they're doing what they say they are doing and that not doing something that's unconstitutional or whatever, whatever uh, foundation you have as a, as a governing principle in whatever country <coughs> you're in. Uh, but you have to have a technical group. I, I, we suggested they pick hackers from the United States because we thought they would be the ones who have a real vested interest in finding things that are problems and uh, give them clearances and authorize them to go in any agency of the intelligence community at any time, anywhere, sit in any desk, look at any program, look at any database, and verify that those lying sons of bitches are what they're doing <laughs> because that's what they are. Jacob Applebaum, will Tor give us our privacy back? Uh, well, so I'm sorry to do this to you, Paul, but um, <laughs> could you stand up? <laughs> this man right here is the most important person in Northern Europe, but definitely in Denmark, working on these issues. And he is one of the few people on the whole planet that can solve it for the rest of us because he's part of the IETF. He works on FreeBSD. He's a part of the actual standards bodies of the internet. So when he convinces the rest of the world that mandatory end-to-end -end encryption, 
peer-to-peer -peer systems, distributed decentralized systems, when those are the standards and they are secure and they're the default, then we will have our privacy back. And it is exactly this man that is working on doing those things. He should never have to buy a drink again in the rest of his life. question. So I'm going to break it down into two parts. Um, when I was in dialogue with him over encrypted email um, in April 2013, he, uh, the anonymous source I was talking with said, uh, just so you know, I, I, I'm going to come forward with my identity and I want you to paint a target on my back. So he had made the decision before we met that he was going to reveal his identity. And then after he said that, then I requested a meeting, a face-to-face, -face, which is sort of how we ended up in, in Hong Kong. His first response was, no, he didn't want to meet. He didn't want to meet for two reasons. One was because he didn't want the story to be about him. And the other was because he felt that there were risks of us being in the same place at the same time if we got shut down. Down, could the reporting actually be stopped? And then he would have taken all these risks for nothing. So we had to talk about both of those things. And ultimately he agreed to meet, and we met in, in Hong Kong. And as we were, um, so what was happening in the week there, is, as you sort of see in the film, is that it becomes clear that the government knows that he's missing. They probably suspect that he's the source. And it certainly becomes clear when, um, the, when the NSA visits um, Lindsay's house and um, Edward Stone and Lindsay, Lindsay Mill's house looking for him. So we, we, there was a bit of a, we were, you know, in Hong Kong, we were publishing and there was a bit of a, a, a ticking clock because we knew that the government knew that he was missing. Um, and these conversations were sort of happened in the context of that. Now, what you see on, and, and I think we all felt that since he had agreed to reveal his identity, that we didn't, that we wanted him to be the first one to articulate his motivation before it was a government press conference uh, naming him. So, so that's what was, that sort of was, there was a sort of a, a compressed timeline. And then on top of that, I would say that we were, I, I mean, I've, I mean, I've filmed in war zones and I can say that filming in Hong Kong was the most stressful environment that I have ever filmed because I really felt that at any moment someone could be like come in the door and, and raid and, uh, and try to stop us from what we were doing. And, and I really felt that it was very palpable. Um, there were conversations between The Guardian and Snowden about providing him for a, a place to stay. And I don't know what happened, but they seem to have fallen. And um, they, f they fell apart at some point. Um, and when, and I think we actually didn't know how short it would be, like after we, we published the video. And that, I think that that was, in a sense, our mistake as journalists not to act faster to get him lawyers so that it wouldn't have been such a close call between him um, having lawyers and, um, and when, the, when the press started knocking on the, on the door. And I think that that's, that's a sort of the mistake of. Um, of myself and, and, and Glenn not knowing. And then there was another thing that I actually thought, I mean, I'd been in, com in communication with him for many months, for actually six months by the time I got to Hong Kong. And in every instance, he actually had another, uh, uh, the next step in his head. And I just didn't know what it was. So he would say like, well, do this and then I'll tell you the next thing. And it was always he had the next step but I never knew what it was. And I think there was a part of me that thought, oh, well, he has the next step. Like he, he's gone there, like I didn't know. It, I, obviously when, when I knew that I went to Hong Kong I knew that he was going to be seeking some uh, asylum, so I actually thought that he had the next step, and that one day I would knock on the door and he would just not be there. And then, but actually, his planning did actually was meeting us and and giving us the information um, so that we could report, and that actually was um, uh, the planning and so that, that he had done up until that point. So at that point, he really did need, um, you know, lawyers, and as 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 you see in the film, um, Sarah Harrison, um, editor of WikiLeaks, came in and and she was able to broker his 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 political asylum and uh, and so you know and so it's thanks to it's thanks to WikiLeaks and Sarah that that he was able to sort of leave Hong Kong after the extradition warrant came. Um, so, but. It, you know, that's, those are some of the circumstances, but it was really sort of, we were moving in a really accelerated um, um, you know, time frame. And then in terms of his you know, ending up in, in, in Russia, as it's, as it's been reported, he actually wasn't planning on going there. That wasn't his ultimate destination. He was transiting through and his passport was revoked. And how is he doing in Russia? So the last time I saw him was in September when I filmed the, the, the scene with him and, and Lindsay. Um, and he seems, he's, he's doing good, he's doing good. I mean, actually, was a, I think he, having her there is, is, is great. He seems like a lot, you know, happier, and a little bit um, like less of the weight of the world on the, on the shoulders. So he seems, he's, he's in good spirits. 
And he's not under pressure from the Russian government to Yeah, divulge. absolutely not. I mean, that was something, again, Sarah Harrison was with him, stayed with him for, uh, for over, I mean, 40 days in the, in the airport in Moscow, and then before that. Um, and, you know, there was no, I mean, he's, uh, he absolutely, what he did was, he, he felt that this was information that the, the public should know, and he worked with journalists, and, that, and, and the journalists are the ones that, are, that have it, and he's not cooperated with any other intelligence agencies. All right, let's see if there's a couple of more questions. Um, you have broken an amazing story. Uh, we've also seen you there all the time, uh, taking a lot of risk. You had a pressure on you before, couldn't travel into your own country. So how did it mean for you? Uh, all right. <laughs> so the first question is, uh, what's it been like for Laura? One thing is breaking a very important story, but uh, you've also taken a number of risks yourself, and what's it been like for you? We'll just get, yeah, go ahead, we'll get uh, two more. If the NSA is lying to the government and the wives and children and each other, who do, who do they serve? I mean, what? Do you know what I mean? Another great question on a very different level. So if the NSA is lying to the government, to the wives, to their children, who do they serve? So that's uh, another level. Is, is there anyone in the back? That, okay, go ahead. Yeah? In the back. <coughs> to the documentary or to the... Say, say it again. The U.S. government and the Danish authorities, how, I think I'll give that to Henrik, yeah. Hey, Henrik, I'm going to give you that question, like, on the reporting. I'm just going to take the microphone up to the back. <laughs> I'm sorry if you couldn't hear me, but my specific question was, how has, or have the Danish authorities reacted to this documentary today? And what about the American embassy in Copenhagen? Just reactions or senses, pretty. Right, thanks. Laura, uh, let's start out with a question about your own personal experience working with this. Um, so, I mean, as, as I said in the beginning, I mean, this is very much told from a first person perspective. And, um, you know, because I'm also a participant, I'm also telling the story, I'm narrating the story. Um, I mean, in a way, this story began, you know, by the fact that I was put on a watch list, you know, because by being put on a watch list, it kind of, it both toughened me up in a certain way. I think when I was first stopped at the border, I thought, well, this is a mistake, I'm a filmmaker, and I was answered questions, and then after it happened, you know, like, you know, a few times in a, after a few years, you stop, you know, that, that, that naivety goes away and you sort of get a little bit tougher. And, and I also got a lot smarter and, and started learning how to use encryption. And actually, Jake was one of the people who taught me how to use encryption so that when, when Snowden finally did um, contact, it, contact me, I actually was capable to, you know, to respond to him and, and, and had the sort of the skills to, um, to communicate securely. And it was also, he was aware of the fact that I'd been put on a watch list, so that was one of the reasons that motivated him. And, and also the body of work that I had done and also that Glenn had done, where we had been both critical of the U.S. policy in the post-9-11 era. We both feel that there are sort of, you know, that, that we've violated fundamental principles of rule of law and, and, and things that the, in the Constitution and things that the country stands for. So, so all those things came together, but on a personal level, I mean, it's, you know, it's been hard. Um, I, I'm not going to say it's not been hard. Um, uh, I, you know, I mean, I, I moved to Berlin so that I could, you know, work there and edit so that I wouldn't have to deal with the border, which became a very antagonistic place um, for me because I couldn't, you know, I mean, every time I traveled, even though it happens every time when you have two people with guns meet you at the airplane every time and ask questions about who you're, who, where you've been and what you're doing, it's, you know, even though you know it's coming, it's still, it's intimidating. Um, on the other hand, it's been profoundly, um, you know, it's been the most profound experience of my life to work on this project and to work with the people that I've worked with. Because I'm working, I mean, from, from, from Jake to Bill to Snowden to Glenn to Jeremy Scahill, these are people who you know, like really put their lives on the line for something that they believe in. And for me, that's, that's incredibly rewarding. So I don't feel like I'm, I'm at all a victim in this. I feel like it's a privilege to do the work. Thanks.
now for that other question. Who does the NSA serve? Uh, well, I think, uh, I think if you looked at it uh, from, from my perspective, the only pe people they serve are themselves. And they do that because they want to build up, um, uh, you have to understand how this government, uh, Eisenhower, Pre President Eisenhower, when he was leaving office in 1960, warned about the military industrial complex and the relationship to government. Well, what happens is uh, if uh, agencies or agency heads are able to get more money and build up their budget, that means they get more contracts, more contractors. So they build up the contracting empire that gives them many more opportunities once they leave office to go in uh, into uh, those industries. And that's fundamentally what's happening. I call it an incestuous relationship between government employees and senior managers and, and industry because they hire them in at vice president level salaries and things like that because they have contacts to get contracts back in the agencies they've left. So, so fundamentally, they're doing it for themselves. Uh, in fact, uh, just before I left the States, I was reading a, uh, an article, I think it was the Washington Post, but I can't be sure, about uh, Congress is now investigating Alexander, General Alexander, the former director of NSA, uh, because he uh, made a lot of money in the stock market with a company called AT&T. <laughs> well, he also ran a program called Fairview, which is run by AT&T, and it's all the fiber optic taps inside the United States, about 80 to 100 of them. Breaking and news. each of those, each of those cost 10 to be somewhere between 10 and 100 million dollars. So you multiply that out, that's a lot of money going to AT&T. Okay, so, so what I'm saying is, he made money through that. Now, uh, in the contracting world, that would be called a conflict of interest. <laughs> okay, Bill. Bill. Yeah. Just one uh, side question to you. Yeah. Because it's like, if you live in Greece, the, sorry, the, the percentages of rich people, I mean really rich, the 1%, is now even richer than before the crisis. And I'm thinking if they don't serve anybody but, but raw money and probably some fascist, uh, at least not socialist idea. Is that what they do, sell shit like that? And, uh, I mean, yes. if they don't serve a certain <laughs> problem. All right. All right, so the, the follow-up was whether this has to do with the 1% uh, serving their own, baking their own cake. I, I have a question, Bill. So on the topic of Fairview, since we're just breaking news here, um, <laughs> I've seen some maps of Fairview that seem to indicate that they have domestic interception points in something like 40 different states. And Fairview they... is? So Fairview, as Bill has just said, is the NSA interception program where they collaborate with the NSA. So for example... It's called domestic or, collection. Yeah, AT&T and NSA. And so essentially they do all, yeah, all the domestic collection, fiber optic cables, the voice over IP switching centers, and in each of these places they're gathering that data. Um, so would you say that Fairview is the only program with approximately 40 interception states? Whoa. <laughs> How many other interception programs <laughs> exist like that, right? in the United States? Well, I mean, you, uh, PRISM in a way is, uh, is that, uh, but also the, 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 see there's three ways they tap the fibers. One is they go to cooperation with the companies, either uh, Verizon, AT&T, or you know, any of the other companies, uh, even, say, British Telecom, or Deutsche Telecom, or any other telecom anywhere in the world, and they can do that with or without the local government's knowledge. Or, if they can't get that hap with directly with the corporation, they go to the government or the agency that they work with in that, in that country and say, why don't we work together to get a uh, fiber tap at certain uh, junctures. Usually they pick, they pick uh, places where uh, fiber optic lines converge because if they put collection devices there, they see multiple lines simultaneously. Uh, plus it's the best point to get uh, all the packets being switched around. And if you cover all those converging points, you get most everything anyway. So that's, that's what they're doing. Uh, and and if, they, if, they, if the government doesn't want to cooperate, um, then they do it unilaterally like they did with the, the, between the uh, major centers for all of the, for Google and others. Uh, they thought that was secure? Well, I, no, not quite, because they did a unilateral tap on them, uh, which they can do basically anywhere in the world. It's a matter of if you can get to the fiber through any means, you can tap it. 
And that's, that's the three ways that they do that. And their view was the major one for, the program was called Stellar Wind. Uh, that started with phones, and then it moved to internet, and then it moved to banking and travel. And so Bill, you used to be a spy stationed at some point in Denmark. So what was the agency that you worked with that tapped the Danish people? I, I was not stationed here. Oh, right, but you, I do you only have visited. You only visited, right. I what was, was a, the agency? I was a visitor. I was here, I, actually I've been here about uh, 12 to 14 times in business, and this is my first visit uh, uh, socially. <laughs> Thanks for coming, Bill. Is there anything more we should know about these visits? Actually, <laughs> well, I mean, we had a very close relationship. How about that? What was the name? It was. It wasn't. Uh... It was the DDRS at that time, the Danish Defense Radio Service. Now it's the DDIS. Right? They reorganized or did something? I think that would be Forsvars Efterretningstjeneste. Can anyone nod? Right. Yes. All right. Well, um, if you think of anything else, we should know we're very interested. All right. Let's just get a couple more. Are there people in the back who I haven't uh, spotted? Because Henrik needs some exercise. Hey, Hen Hen Henrik, Henrik, can you field the question about the embassy? Any response from um, in any of the recording, not just the film? Do we want the full response or just the short, short version? Just in general, like into the recording. Any so, so there's been an official, very nonsensical, legalistic phrase that says we have no reason to assume that there's any spying against Danish interests or Denmark. It's a very nonsensical sentence. The, the sort of non-formal response has been, A, he's a spy. B, he's a Russian spy, C, he's a Chinese spy, or D, he's doing it for personal profits or whatever, so. Or E, it's fake, which I think Denmark True. is the only country still following that line. But. <laughs> yeah, um, my question is actually related to Danish reporting. Uh, right after uh, Snowden got stuck in Russia, uh, senior reporters in Denmark suggested that uh, he probably traded secrets for uh, getting asylum there. From your knowledge of him, uh, does that sound uh, plausible or uh, what do you think about that, Laura? Yeah, it's absolutely not plausible. I mean, absolutely not. And and we know that for many reasons. One is because Sarah Harrison was there with him. And she's the one who broke. You know, she she she's submitted applications in many countries, and she was with him the whole time. And that I mean, do you want to also? That which is presented without evidence may be dismissed without argument. <laughs> what a bunch of bullshit! Do you have any evidence? I mean, it sounds like a fun spy game, and that sounds like what people would understand from watching James Bond, but is there actually any evidence that supports that? And the answer is no. Actually, what happened is, for the first time in, in my life, Russia did the right thing with regard to human rights. <laughs> that must burn so badly for everyone that is in a position to criticize Russia. All right, let's just see, uh, Henrik is all the way... Could, could oh, I, sure. Could I add one thing there? Actually, what the U.S. government wanted to do was to apply the 1917 Espionage Act against, uh, against Snowden. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, that has a death penalty with it, okay? Now, in order to do that, he has to have a, a, a foreign country that he's working for. So that's why they have to make that allegation, because they, they, they used that against Tom Drake and against other people in, in my country, like uh, Dan Ellsberg and so on. Uh, well, that people people realize that they're they're trying to you know buffalo everybody, so they they can't get away with that anymore unless they can point to a foreign country, and that's what the law says. You know, you're a spy for a foreign enter enterprise or a foreign country, uh, and so that's why they're trying to do they're trying to use that because they want to give them the death penalty. That's why. Do we have him like with someone in the back? Yeah. Uh, hello. Um, I'm just kind of curious on if people. I uh, can't take the measure of the uh, self-encryption of using Tor and that type of uh, devices. What's the minimum thing that the average person should do to, to protect their own self and information? Hold on, let me just get one more. Do we have one more? <laughs> it's good for me. He rides his bike to Berlin from Copenhagen, so he's fine. Such a tall drink of water, that guy. 
Hi, I just wanted to hear about your process um, when you're collecting the material from the beginning. Um, if you knew that it would be from first person perspective or like, cause it seemed you had, you were accumulating material until the very end, how it was, yeah, the whole process. All right, I hear that is one for Jacob and one for Laura, I think. So um, if Tor is too complicated for you, then what's the minimum you should do? I think, um, if we talk about it in terms of technology, then we lose. Um, instead, we should talk about it in terms of what we're willing to accept in terms of society and personally. And so what I would suggest is, if the technology is too difficult, make political pressure to make it easier to use. Make it so that the Danish government funds Paul's work so that he never, ever has to go and work for someone like Google, for example. Make it so that he's free to make it easy for you to do it. But do that by refusing to accept this as the status quo by just saying, no, this is not what I want. For example, the US Embassy here in Copenhagen, I believe is a special collection center for the NSA. They do interception. I, th I think that's the case, right? Yeah, okay, so sure, let's go with that. I'm pretty sure that's true. Why is that building still standing? I really want to know. And if it continues to stand, why doesn't it stand for the things that you would like it to stand for? That is what is important, and that has nothing to do with technology, and it has everything to do with organization. And that is something that every person can do, especially you if you find technology too hard, because what else will you do? And if not now, when will you do it? Um, so the process of making this film, I, in, in every film I've made, I usually go in with some some interest in some broad themes, and then I start filming. I'm not, I, I never know where the where actually the filming is going to take me, and that's actually part of the beauty of doing the work because you you don't know, and then hopefully that if it goes someplace interesting, then you're on a journey that the audience can go on that will be interesting. But there's a lot of uncertainty in it. Um, <clears throat> I, I started filming both with um, with Bill and Jake and Glenn Greenwald in the spring of 2011. And I also started filming a bit later after that with um, Julian Assange. And I was interested in this sort of themes of, I was interested in um, surveillance, NSA, sort of a new kind of journalism, a more adversarial kind of journalism, and whistleblowers, and, and the kind of um, activists who were you know, um, doing work that was resisting what their states were. Um, uh, the states that they were working in or living in. So I was interested in all those kinds of things, and I was and I was moving towards making that film. And then I rec started receiving emails um, in in um, in January 2013. And then and that obviously then changed the film in the sense that it drew me into the narrative in a way that I wasn't before. And so then it became clear when we were we were editing. A couple things became clear. One is that. I'd actually shot two films, so I have material that will that will be that will be part of some another film. But um, but also that that I needed to be um, you know it needed to be told from a subjective point of view because I I was the one who was receiving um, the emails. I was the one. I mean, he had reached out to Glenn separately, but I also reached out to Glenn. I mean, a lot of the things that happened happened because I was directly involved, and so it was clear that I needed to be um, part of the film. Um, but the, I mean, the way that I work as a filmmaker, I mean, I'm, um, I, like in Hong Kong, I didn't have a crew. I was doing my own. I was doing the camera and the sound. And so for me, like what I, for, for me, I feel like the images are what I use to express myself. So it's a very subjective thing, even if I'm not in front of the camera, uh, the way that I frame or the, or the choices that I make are, are trying to communicate something about the world that I'm seeing. And so, it, so, I'm, so I'm in the film sort of as a narrator, but then also as, you know, as a person who's framing um, uh, the, the, what's unfolding. All right, and before uh, we take up, I know Tina uh, would like to say a word, but before she does that, uh, I want to thank the panel. Uh, this, I'm just a journalist in some corner of the world, but this has for me been a transformative experience too. And uh, I want to thank you three so much for this experience this evening. Uh, thank you, William Binney, Laura Poitras, Jacob Applebaum. Thank you so much. <laughs>
So thank you to all of you. This is a very short announcement, but you need to stay seated because you need to help us. While you've been seeing the films, we've convinced Laura that uh, we're going to take Citizen Four into cinemas across Denmark from next week onwards. So we need you. We need you to help spread the word, and uh, because there are so many journalists here tonight, we need help again next week to talk about the film and spread it all over the country. We need grown-ups, kids, schools, everyone to see this film.